Ladies and gentlemen, Keith Carter. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very, very much for coming. I appreciate this. I, I know I don't look like much. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I want to tell you in that part of my life uh, revolves around art, and part of my life uh, revolves around the world of education for over three decades, that uh, the word photography comes from the Greek. It means writing or drawing with light. I always thought from the get-go that was kind of an ecclesiastical thing. It was lovely. It wasn't just making purely descriptive uh, images of things. It had to do with more. Um, and that's a personal uh, philosophy uh, to, to some extent. And I wanted to tell, since some of you are students, and bless your hearts for coming, um, uh, and some of you are working artists too, what I've learned over the uh, uh, close to four decades now is it's almost impossible to focus energy to do the work if you don't know what you're working toward. You have to have a goal in mind, something uh, in mind, or you just do your greatest hits over and over. In my world, what I learned was uh, and it's probably because I love, like everybody else, I love books. I learned I needed to have a title. If I could give myself a title that was relatively open-ended, you know, mojo, heaven of animals, something like that, then I was free to, to let my imagination roam to make the photographs. I really want to make photographs, even though I know sometimes my colleagues think, the guy can't even focus a camera. <laughs> I understand that. Um, but I also want to tell you that anybody that's in the arts, period, we stand on the shoulders of giants. I mean, it's the people that came before us. I mean, that's what we've got, and that's what we take take forward, and I won't get ecclesiastical about stuff like that. The other thing I wanted to tell you uh, was I think, I know, it's a miracle when a book comes out. I mean, to me, they're holy objects. Uh, I think it's, pardon me, God's own miracle when a good one comes out, that kind of thing. But I wanted to tell you, because the designer uh, that I've worked with for a number of years is uh, here also. Uh, and it's one thing to make a body of work and spend several years constructing, try to make some coherent, intelligent images. Um, it's a whole nother uh, world to put them in this kind of format. Um, and uh, there are a lot of decisions to go into to it uh, that I won't go into. Um, there are people who can speak to it better. But cover image is always important. Trim size in the world of art books is always important. Will it fit on a bookshelf, store, uh, you know, shelf, period? All that kind of stuff. But I, I learned as I go, uh, and I uh, paid attention to what DJ Stout of Pentagram, who I've worked with on a number of projects, but how careful they are to use sans serif or seraphin type. Sans serif doesn't have the little legs to stand on. I know, I'm being a professor. <laughs> you know, I mean, little things like that. Or how much space is behind, between the type, all those things. Everything goes into a really beautiful, well done book. Um, not by accident, that kind of thing. And um, it's always a privilege to work with people who are better than you are at, at something. So uh, I want to, again, thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. And I hope I get a chance to, uh, to talk to, to you. And, uh, uh, and um, DJs, since I spoke highly of you, you should treat me better. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Hope you enjoy it. Keith, you don't get to sit. You get to come back up. If there are questions from the house, we're recording this, so if you could wait for one of two microphones that our two students will be passing around.
What are the other things that helped you move forward in your career? I mean, <clears throat> the support system that you had, like oh, what were those things as an artist that yeah, were really sure. influential for you? Well, uh, f for one thing, uh, uh, I, I learned from books. I mean, I was in a relatively uh, non-photographic uh, world in terms of the art world, and anytime I could get my hands on a book, I, uh, a good book, uh, I would pour over it. And I used to travel around the state photographing children. I went to every library in every single little town or big town I could go to just to see what they had in the photography section. And that's not like going to a graduate school. That's a different type of learning. But I poured over those books. And uh, that's probably why I make eclectic imagery in some, some respects. Uh, but uh, I found it a, a, a profound world where everything wasn't just pretty photographs. You know, there were depth and multiple meanings to people's lives and choices we made. And, and I wanted to try and put some of that in my work. And in terms of budgets in those days, I didn't have any money like a lot of people, you know, that kind of thing. So I was pretty much tied to a certain region, which is kind of how I started to take my muddy, flat uh, area where I live and try to fashion uh, art. I started thinking of it as folk art, and then I started thinking of it as high art. That's not necessarily useful to you. Um, that's just what happened to me. But if I were a student, or if I gave, you know, and there are a few of you here, you know, what kind of work do you want to do, you know? What is it you want to say? I mean, this is your big shot. What do you want to say? You can change it, you know, that kind of thing. And the other thing is, you got to do the work. You can talk about it till you're blue in the face. It doesn't count. You've got to do the work. And that takes um, time, takes energy, it takes all the things that most of you know. And I think it's not unhealthy at least in the arts, to be a little bit obsessive about what you do. That's how you get good. That's how you get the work done. You know, you just can't talk about it. You've got to do it. I sound like a professor now. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, DJ Stout. I'm, I worked with Keith on the book. Yay. And uh, um, I have this. Uh, Keith, I have a serious question, but the first thing I wanted to point out was, I think you were saying that that typeface on the cover was sans serif typeface? No, I that's said a that, serif that, that's typeface. seraphim typeface. <laughs> Sa I know you are a teacher. So. Yeah. And, um, well, anyway, um, I, I just wanted to ask you, Keith, I think I, I know the answer to this, but you've been working on this particular project for a while. Um, what I, and I call this project Swamp Thing, is what I call it. Um, <laughs> and, but when uh, I was the art director at Texas Monthly Magazine, and I remember Keith would always go into portraits in what he called the Baygall, which was a swampy area in Beaumont. Particularly, we did a, uh, a fashion shoot one time. We had all this kind of high dollar clothing and Keith hired some locals to be models, and they completely destroyed the, all the clothes in the swamp. I was proud but, of that. <laughs> so, but I just wanted to know, what is your fascination with the swamp? <laughs> well, uh, uncharacteristically, that's a good question, DJ. <laughs> It's a personal thing. Um, uh, I grew up in a, a swampy area. <clears throat> we have what are called bagels and so on and so forth. And nobody wanted to go in them. You know, uh, they're dark, they're scary, uh, they're muddy, there's lots of mosquitoes, there's snakes. Uh, however, I thought that they were just beautiful, or could be. You know, you have to wear waders and things like that. But it was like being in a, a um, a completely alien landscape. It's easy, at least to me, 
It's easy to make a pretty picture. It's not that hard nowadays. But it's difficult to take something that you're trying to explore and <clears throat> raise the aesthetic elevation. If you can, that's a big mouthful. But I like the darkness of them. I love the fact there's no life on Earth without water. I like the water. I like the uh, uh, anthropomorphic shapes, particularly with uh, the cypress knees and things of these, uh, this nature. And I thought there's got to be a way to make them coherent in some, some respect. I mean, hunters go out there all the time, but most people don't go for the practice of aesthetics or, or pleasure or fun. And the most important thing I learned is if you're a guy like me that's not very big and not very, uh, doesn't weigh a whole lot and you're wearing chest waders, well, let me tell you, water? <laughs> one gallon of water weighs eight and a half pounds. And if you slip and your chest waders fill up with water, 50 yards from shore where you're waiting, it's uh, a little bit difficult, problematic, and s scary to, to try and ex extricate yourself. And long story short, that happened. The only way I could figure out, and I was by myself at the time, was to get out of the waders. <laughs> you know, you just couldn't move. I got, I was just sunk. I couldn't move. And I, anyway, so. Um, they're uh, elegant and they're uh, peculiar. They're, they're just a little edgy and a little dangerous. Uh, and they're just gorgeous. I mean, to me. Yeah. But what do you find interesting? What, if you were going to do a project, what if you were going to spend two years on something? What's your novel? What's your interest? What do you care about? It ain't for sissies. <laughs> Making pretty pictures is easy. Sorry you asked. <laughs> Anybody else? So Keith, I know you worked with Sally and Bill with Live for many years. So I have two questions. Um, how did that relationship begin? And what is your favorite Bill Whitliff story? <laughs> well, hey, my favorite Bill Whitliff, Whitliff story is naughty. You know? <laughs> Bring it. <laughs> As we say in the vernacular, I ain't telling you that. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I, met, I met Bill and, and later Sally. Um, he, he called me up one day. And I, I knew his name because I had a couple of his uh, books. Uh, and he said that, uh, uh, or actually my wife picked up the phone and she laughed, and she laughed, and she laughed. And I thought she was talking to one of her good friends, just laughing or uh, having fun. And, uh, and then she finally covered up, and she said, you need to take this. It's Bill Whitliff. <laughs> and I thought, where do I know that name? Anyway, um, one thing led to another. And he said, I'm going to start this collection. Uh, and I'm going to make it uh, a trove of variety of arts but I want to start with photography, and I'd like to come visit you. And um, I think I'm digressing to the actual question you answered, but that's how Bill and Sally came into um, my late wife, Pat, and my uh, existence. Uh, and it was a wonderful thing. And he was a Renaissance man in many, many ways. Renaissance men, or women, are complicated people. It's not always hunky-dory hanging out with them, <laughs> but it's always worth listening to. And I want to tell you one other thing that not, not been asked, but I couldn't get the work I've been lucky to do in the last 50 years done had it not been for my late wife, Pat, period, period. If you have, if you're, particularly if you're younger, if you have somebody believe in you, that makes a lot of difference. That goes a long way. You can withstand poverty. You can withstand all kinds of stuff. But 
to have somebody that really believed in you, cared about you, and said, no, this is what we need to be doing. And the other thing, uh, other thing that, that I wouldn't be standing here today, and I certainly wouldn't have this book had it not been for my almost three decade uh, long time, she prefers the word assistant. I, I think of her as a coworker, Kathy Spence. Yeah. I mean, Kathy's been great. Yeah. It's, it's not self-serving, it's true. I mean, it's hard to produce a lot of work by yourself. You know, it's hard to evolve it if you don't have somebody to talk to, to bounce an idea off of. You know, you can work in a vacuum, uh, and you can probably do pretty well sometimes. That's not been uh, the best path uh, or the most fertile path for me. Uh, so I, I draw from a lot of uh, sources. Um, to make the kinds of pictures I make, but uh, the, the, uh, I, show them to, I show them to Kathy now instead of Pat. You know, I say, what do you think? And they'll tell you the truth. And it always hurts my feelings when they don't think I'm not, ge not a genius. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Anybody else? Am I? Yes. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute before you get going because you go on forever. Stop them. <laughs> Hold it, wait, no, I want to say this. 25 years ago, Texas Monthly is, is uh, celebrating their 50th anniversary, I think, coming up here. 25 years ago, I had done some work for Texas Monthly, and, and they had their 25th anniversary. And DJ and I had worked together, and they asked me, bless their hearts, to be part of the program. And I was backstage and the publisher of Texas Monthly, who just stand, stands up right now to read me out, no doubt. <laughs> I didn't even know, but I knew who Michael Levy was. And he looked at me, and he came right up, and I swear to you, this is the truth. He poked me in the shoulder, <laughs> or in the chest. And he pushed me back against the wall. <laughs> and he said, let me tell you something, kid. There's never been a bad short speech. <laughs> You're I have never forget, forgotten it, and he's right. Okay. Um, a couple of things. First of all, what exactly do you have written on your palm? <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, my. <laughs> the other one. The other one. My palm. Yeah, it's that one, though. This one. No, no, no. It's that one. <laughs> Those are my notes, so I don't screw up. <laughs> uh, first of all, a little clarification. The reason we study history is we're supposed to learn from it. And you studied the history of man from the very beginning of time you learn one profound truth, which is there's never ever been a bad short speech, a bad short eulogy, or a bad <laughs> short sermon. With that, uh, when we started the magazine, we wanted great journalism, and we knew that the best graphic support for great journalism was great photojournalism. And, you know, the writers get all the attention, you know, they're, they have the brands, but uh, it was photographers who were equally important uh, they brought people into the tent. If it weren't for Keith and his uh, uh, contemporaries with the magazine, it would have just been type on paper. Uh, all of these photographers were great, but one guy was a little greater than everybody else. The first time he appeared in the pages of the magazine, uh, the people who weren't home. aficionados <laughs> would still come up to me and said, wow. The Keith Carter story is great. I think for the sake of the students here, they need to know where the story began uh, in Beaumont, Texas. I call it the Keith and his mama story. You mind telling the students no, that story? No, actually, that's the first time you've been had brevity. That's good. No. <laughs> Thank you. No, I'm just being funny, and I'm not funny. Uh, and I thank you for asking that question. Mama. My mother was a single parent household, head of a household, before it became so fashionable. 
and my mother was a photographer of children, and I was the oldest of three. And she gave me a little camera when I was six. And when I graduated from college, I started to go out and make some photographs. And it was my mom. I brought them back, had them processed in a drugstore, and showed them to my mom. I know how that sounds, but moms are holy people. I showed them to my mom, and she said, Honey, you have a good eye. You have a nice sense of design. Those two sentences. And I thought, huh, I have a good eye. I have a nice sense of design. My mom told me so. I know how that sounds, but it's the truth. You can go to graduate school for two years, and you hope you get the truth like that, you know? Just one of those things. I call them perfect moments when you don't expect anything to happen and something just shifts a little bit. It's a perfect moment. Hi. Hi. I'm new to Texas and new to your art. I really enjoyed seeing this show. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the lighting in your photographs. Is it all natural lighting? Is it time of day? Did you manipulate the light in any way? Well, thank you for the question. That's a good, coherent question, and it's useful. Uh, uh, I, I work uh, in that particular project, but 99% of my projects, I work with natural light. I don't set up flashes and things like that, uh, certainly outside. I, I generally work with natural light. To make a long story short, I generally try, and that particular body of work that I worked on for almost three years, I tried really hard to go out early in the mornings because I liked the fog and, you know, it was just beautiful. And it's a new day. Or late in the afternoons. That's classic. After a while, <clears throat> um, the subject matter just seemed to, to almost run together. I was thinking, this is not working, you know. I mean, uh, they looked okay. So I decided at that time to use improper light mostly because it would drive some of my colleagues who were totally anal retentive nuts, you know. And I liked that. That was kind of fun. So I started using all kinds of light. Um, and my theory was it's beautiful. It's all beautiful, you know. Um, just be coherent. Make, make, it, make it work. Um, but I still think the, the classic rules, you know, early mornings, late afternoons uh, are the best times of types of light, but I've always just liked natural light. I, in this body of work, I used everything from ant antiquarian processes to digital processes. Uh, I'm an equal opportunity uh, employer. I just use it all. So uh, some of those are made with a great big 8x10 camera uh, on a great big tripod slogging through there. Uh, and if you use wet plate, that's a mixture of ether, alcohol, and gun cotton. And it's a warping chore, particularly if you're in the swamps. You got to coat a plate, you got to put it, you got to compose everything, and put the plate in while it's still wet, make the photograph, go over to some dry land and process the photograph, all within about five minutes. And you get a big eight by 10 plate. You know, that's your quote negative. I did that to everything, to the digital world. You know, but the digital world, and this is just a personal opinion. There's no real depth to this statement. Uh, the digital world, um, uh, for me, is almost too precise. I, I, I don't, I don't like, I don't know of anything perfect. It's not my uh, world, and um, it was always those little imperfections that I had affection for. And that's probably just a personal thing. So now, when I do work with digital, I kind of screw it up, too. <laughs> just a little bit. Now, if I photograph you straight on, your lovely face, straight on, there's no perspective changes. No problem. Nothing to change anything in your mind when you look at it. However, if I tilt the horizon line just a tad, a little bit, not enough to screw you up. But all of a sudden, 
when you look at it, something's off, but you don't know quite what, or there's a different depth there, uh, that kind of thing. If I uh, change my depth of field, depth of field is what's in focus from the foreground to the background. If I wanted everybody in focus in this room, I would use a certain, what we call f-stop. If I just wanted something in the foreground in focus, which I do all the time, uh, I would use a different f-stop. But my theory is we see in short depth of field. If, if I look at my friend Reed here, he's in focus. But everybody behind him out of focus. His mother next to him is out of focus. But if I shift, you know, that kind of thing. And that's a remarkable thing. I don't think a lot of photographers don't pay too much attention to the possibilities there. But perfection in my world, since I don't live in a per perfect kind of world, um, I just think it's overrated <laughs> a little bit in the arts. In love, make it perfect. <laughs> you know. Anybody else? Keith. Dennis, hey, how are you? I'm good. So uh, I, I know it's a loving and friendly thing, but uh, can you tell us how, I think it's just a handful of people south of I-10, but why, does, why do some people call you Kip? <laughs> Why? People call me Kip, K-I-P, and those that know me. And long story short, this is what my mom told me anyway. She said she always just really liked the name Kit. She said, you know, Kit Carson, um, things like that. And she said, I was going to name you Kit. And my, her, my dad at the time said, um, no, that was not the right thing to call him. So they called me Kip. But I, my real name is Keith, but that's where it came from. It was going to be Kit, and it just became a Kip. And, and now that I'm an old guy, I kind of like Kip. Yeah. I've always liked little Kippy Butler. <laughs> yeah, I was Kippy for a long time. But you've got the same kinds of names. It's not just me. <laughs> Stevie. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, this yes, ma'am. Um, I'm right here. So. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I saw um, somebody over there. Touching base back to, I think it's so much of the first question. Um, how do you get over imposter syndrome? Would you say that again? Like, how do you get over imposter syndrome? Do you know what that is? In what syndrome? Imposter, imposter syndrome. Imposter? I don't know what that is. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> I'm from Beaumont. <laughs> I, I milk that whenever I can. I don't know. <laughs> what, what, what was the I have that problem. You don't have that What's problem. the question? Imposter um, syndrome is feeling like you don't, coming from a little town, you know, feeling well. like you don't really belong in the big league. Oh, I belong it's in the like, big league. It's <laughs> <laughs> well, if you I'm ever feel deal. like overwhelmed, if you've ever felt like that, kind of like, mm, I don't know if I should be here, that type of feeling. Like, if you've had moments like that, how do you cope with it or how do you push through? <laughs> it's, it's the echo, it's not you, it's the echo. You, have you ever felt overwhelmed by uh, being the superstar you? Well, <laughs> if, if she translates correctly. <laughs> we put him back in his, he gets overwhelmed, but we kind of keep him, you know, he's got a lot of people supporting I, him. I'd, Family, friends, they keep him in line. In line. <laughs> really, it's true. It's true. Uh, uh, let me tell you, I don't, if you don't mind. I don't mind. Me. So his late white wife, Pat, had a wonderful, has a wonderful friend, Catherine Carmichael, who has a little, um, who has a little uh, shop, a restaurant at the time. We were all, all three of us with Keith sitting around the little table, 
and one of his former students and good friends uh, came in and was talking about you know Keith's next big book, and he said, and he said, do you know what? What I've always admired about Keith was his that no matter what happened to him, he was all he's always been humble. And we were quiet for a minute. And then we all three busted out laughing. <laughs> Welcome to my world. <laughs> you have to have faith in yourself if you're going to be in the arts. You probably have to have faith in yourself in just about anything. You know, it, it's an unsure world. Anybody else? So you talked about how important a title is, oh. and I'm wondering how did you think of Ghostlight, and how do these pictures fit into that title. Yeah. And um, just another question. How long did you have to wait around for those boars to make that crossing in that one picture? The boars to make the walking across the road. <laughs> the photograph with the pigs. Oh. Crossing. <laughs> what was the first part? <laughs> how, did you, how did you come up with Ghost Light? Oh. Uh, um, I love titles. Period. I keep a little uh, notebook. Uh, and I put titles when they come to me at odd times. Um, I'm not above appropriating somebody's t title. Uh, you can't copyright titles, by the way. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, it stimulates my imagination. Uh, and uh, having worked with a, a really wonderful designer, uh, D DJ Stout, for a long time, um, I, I pay close attention to how the typography is going to look. Uh, that may sound shallow, but I think, no, how does that actually look as a word? I love the word. Bill Whitliff loved words. I mean, just loved words, and we talk about words. So uh, I keep a notebook, uh, and I use them, uh, and I like elliptical things. I like things that have uh, words that have multiple meanings rather than um, the Pecos River, you know. Uh, something that has more, more um, possibilities, or maybe poetic possibilities. I don't know. So that's that's my uh, half-baked theory, anyway. I, I just I like the way they look. Oh, and ghost light. Um, uh, you're gonna love this. It just came to me. <laughs> You know, we were talking, I don't know who I was talking to, and I said, these are ghosty, you know. And I said, well, I didn't mean them to be ghosty. That's just what's out there, you know. And uh, I said, they're ghosty. And, um, and uh, anyway, I was probably just thinking. And, and we did play with Ghost Land. Yeah, we tried Ghost, Ghost Land. Land. We went back mm -hmm. and forth a little bit. And I pulled a DJ Stout. I, I would write it out in different typographies to see what it looks like before I give it to him and he messes it up. <laughs> I was pushing for swamp thing. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I didn't listen to it. <laughs> Anybody else? And how'd you get those pigs? How long you have to oh, the pigs. Well, I, the, the truth. I hate telling the truth sometimes, but the truth is I made that photograph of those wonderful uh, trees in North Carolina on that wonderful road. But I made those pigs on a different island. Oh. And I took a playbook out of contemporary processes today. And actually, it was Kathy uh, who we selected them and moved them from one photograph to another photograph. Cool. Now, that's the. Uh, <laughs> That's the truth. Um, but, and I probably have said this, and don't take it to the bank, but I think rules in art is a pejorative term. It just stops you, you know? Uh, and we're nice, clean Americans, and we want to do things by the rules, and, and there are times to do that. But in art, I mean, that just stops possibilities. So I try anything today, and I don't see any reason or any sin in, try, in taking advantage of technology. But I'm old school. I come from a dark room. I like the physical part. I like being there. I like doing it. 
I love paying attention to the light. I like the smells. I like everything about it. I made a bunch of really bad wet plate collodion 8 by 10 plates, ether, alcohol, and gun cotton. And they were crappy, but I liked all the aberrations in them. So we scanned them. New technology. Scan my bad 8 by 10 physical plates. And then I did th that series of pictures, um, which I'm very fond of, by the way. And um, they just merely looked good to me. They just, they looked good. Looked like everybody else's good pictures of, you know, that kind of thing. And I don't know if it was Kathy or it was me, but one of us, we were sitting there trying to say, let's, let's try, put that background with that. Now, that's digital part. So of using historical processes, and Kathy's the one that figured out how to do it. And when you watched it come out in the dark room, when you put a photograph to develop in the tray, it comes up slowly. And it's magical to watch, if you've ever seen that. What Kathy ended up doing is we just covered, she covered it with that texture, that big texture. My picture was disappeared. And then slowly started to bring it back. And that's what just really excited me immediately. And when something excites me like that, immediately, I don't question it. I'm thinking, OK, trust your intuition. Trust your impressions. There's something here. Let's do this. A lot of people, some of my colleagues out there, hate that kind of thing. But it worked. It looked right to me. It just looked right. And then, uh, again, my ideal viewer is Kathy. And she went, oh. So that's where it came from. We, we just revealed it. Uh, it was an accident, and we were experimenting. And this is one of my favorite group of pictures. I'm going to do that a lot now. <laughs> you got to try things. Yeah. You're going to do the same thing over and over? You can try things. Anybody I th else? I think we have time for one more question. Mm -hmm. Hey, Keith, so as someone who loves and goes through the, the torture of wet plate photography and loves the dark room, I find it interesting that you call digital photography perfection, uh, given that our eyes evolved over hundreds of millions of years to see light waves and for our brain to interpret that. The only thing that has hundreds of millions with digital is a bunch, hundreds of millions of zeros and ones trying to imitate that. So is it perfection or? Well, that's an existential <laughs> question. <isn't it? laughs> and I'll go with whatever you come up with. I'm an artist. I'm just trying to get the work done. You know, I'm trying to figure out how to get it done and how to make it coherent and intelligent in some ways. And um, I think if you're an artist, particularly young, young students here, play, play to your strengths. You're always going to find people who don't think it's the way to go. You know, but that's how new things get done, at least for you. Try it. Try it. See what it looks like. You know, if you're in my class and you try it and it just barely works, I'll give you an A <laughs> if you try it, OK? Doesn't make you make an A for the semester, but I'll give you an A for that day. <laughs> All right, everybody, Keith Carter. <laughs> <laughs>